All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very special birthday edition of Daily Power Power Show, Ray's birthday edition. Ray, we're all wishing you just lots of blessings and lots of happiness on this very special day of your birthday. Okay, Torah oh, portion this week is Chukat. Tor- so- sorry, that was last week. I, that was so last week. Torah portion this week is Balak. What is Balak? Balak is the name of the fellow who was the king of Moab at the time. And at this point in the Jewish journey, the Jewish people are making their approach to the land of Israel. They have taken out some nations that started waging war against them, and they've been very successful. And so now Moab is, the nation is terrified. The king is leading the terror, by the way. Not a good move for a leader to instill fear in the people. I guess it could be a strategy, but not from a Jewish perspective. That's not what a, what a leader is supposed to do. A leader is supposed to lead, not to sow fear. And yet Balak does exactly that. He then joins up, joins forces with Midian, although they are themselves fighting or have historically been enemies. They join together against a common enemy that is the Jewish people. God forbid we should have any enemies anyway. And they, they reach out to this fellow named Balaam to curse the Jewish, to attempt to curse the Jewish people. One set of messengers goes to recruit him. He rejects the, he says, let me speak. I'll communicate with God. I'll let you know in the morning. He says, no, I can't go with you. Uh, With an emphasis on with you, I can't go. And so the message comes back to the King. The King sends even more chashuv, even more important uh, messengers with more promises of money. And uh, Balak once again says, you know, even if you gave me all the money in the world or a house filled with gold and silver, I still could not go against the word of God. Uh, let me speak with God again. And at that time, the second night, this well, I don't know if it was one night after the other, but the second set of messengers, at this point, God communicates to Bil- Balaam saying, um, if you want, you can go, but you're only going to be able to say what I want you to say. You're not going to be able to say whatever you want to say. You're going to speak the words that I put in your mouth. Now, that leads us into today's reading. All of that was a review of the first two readings. Now we're up to reading number three. This is Numbers chapter 22, verse 21. Okay? Now, in the morning, Balaam, Balaam is the prophet, Balaam arose, saddled his she-donkey, and went with the Moabite dignitaries. Remember, those were the messengers, uh, the recruiters that came to recruit him. There were two two sets, two rounds of this. Finally, the second set, he says, okay, we're good, let's go. And so they start going. Verse 22. God's wrath flared because he was going. God is not happy. And an angel, and I have an obvious question to ask. I'll ask that in a moment. And an angel of the Lord stationed himself on the road to thwart him. <laughs> and he was riding on the she donkey and his two servants were with him. I feel like before we get into the details about this angel, which is a major piece of the story, I do need to talk about God's wrath flaring. God's wrath flared because he was going. But if you look at the previous reading, and I've recapped this already verbally, but let's just read this inside. God came to Balaam at night. That was the previous verse and said to him, if these men have come to call for you, arise and go with them. But the word I will speak that you shall do. God says, go, arise and go with them. And then the very next verse, sorry, two verses later, God's wrath flared because he was going. Holy cow, God, make up your mind. Two verses ago, you said go, and now you're getting angry because he went. What's going on over here? In fact, if you look at the narrative, you find that God's position seems to have changed multiple times. Initially, when the first set of messengers came to recruit him, initially, God, and, he, and Balaam communicated with God, God initially said, do not go. The second round, God says, you can go. And then when he goes, God gets angry. So it's a no, a yes, and a no. What's going on over here? Is God changing his mind? Is God being wishy-washy? No, you can't go. Okay, you can go. How dare you go? Is that, is that what's going on here? doesn't make sense. 
Many commentaries have said many things about this. I personally love what Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi, the late great Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs writes about this. He says, God never changed his mind. He said no, and God knows a no. How, how many times do you have to ask God? He asks God, can I go? And God says, no. Or he says, should I go? No. You ask again, God says, do whatever you want. That doesn't mean go. It means do whatever you want. Sure, go. That's not a yes. There's a difference between yes and if you want, go ahead. Yes means God is saying it's a good thing. God already said, no, it's not a good thing. Now, the human being, in this case, Balaam, the person comes back to God and says, but I really, really, really want to go. At that point, God says, I've given you free choice. Go. You with me on this? When God says go the second time, it's not God saying, I li I'd like you to go. God is saying, if you're going to go, go. If you want to go, then go. Knock yourself out. That's not God saying yes. It's God not forcing the no. It's God basically saying, I've given you free choice. Now, when Balaam actually goes ahead with his plan and actually heads out on the journey, God's upset. But didn't God say go? He didn't say go. He said, fine, if you want, go. But I don't want you to go. You with me on this? So God's position, and I think it's a, I think it's a beautiful, or elegant, and also very powerful way of understanding the narrative. Again, to summarize it, God did not change his mind. From the beginning until the end, God said no. I, we just read a verse at the end of the second reading that says that God says go. It was still a no. And what he says, he says, don't go. But if you really want to go, go. That's not a yes. That's a do whatever you want. That's a I've given you free choice. I'm not going to stand in the way. It's like a parent tells the kid, you're not going to do what I tell you anyway. So just do, go and do what you want to do. Yeah. That doesn't mean the parent is saying, yes, I love this. Exactly. That does not constitute consent. That's not, I, I approve of this message. That's not that. That's, I disapprove of this message, but go ahead. Because I've given you free choice. Because you're your own person, whatever it is, right? That's not a stamp of approval. That's a whatever. Whatever. Now, when, in this case, when Balaam actually then, the next morning, actually gets on his donkey and starts riding out, God's like, are you kidding me? I told you no. That yes wasn't a real yes. That was like, whatever. That wasn't a real yes. Now that you did it, now I'm upset. Not that God actually gets upset. That's a human emotion. But anyway, God decides to set the stage for ultimately Balaam's humiliation. There's one thing that evokes humbling. And that is trying to uh, go against God, right? If there's one thing that we know doesn't usually end well, certainly biblically, it's like somebody says, I'm going to outsmart God, right? Balaam is trying to outsmart God. God said no, then he got like a, a, a shaky yes, and now he's like, well, let me go. God is basically going to teach him a lesson um, illustrating and emphasizing that God is still in control despite what Balaam would love to believe. So, uh, buckle up for the next part of the journey. This ride is about to get bumpy. And when I say that, I mean literally because the donkey gets a little bit uh, <laughs> a little bit bumpy on the ride. All right, here we go. Let's jump right in. So um, again, what's important to know is Balaam and um, the she donkey. Those are the main characters right now of this little uh, mini, mini soap saga. Okay, so God's wrath back in verse 22. God's wrath flared because he was going. Because why did you go? I said, sure, whatever, but that wasn't a yes. Fine. And an angel of the Lord, I know I read this, but I'm doing it again. An angel of the Lord stationed himself on the road to thwart him. So imagine, just like imagine, obviously not a paved road, but like a dirt road, a dirt path, and an angel just standing in the middle of the road to block, to block the progress of the donkey. 
And Balaam was riding on the she donkey and his two servants were with him. So what happens next is shocking. The she donkey saw the angel of the Lord stationed on the road with his sword drawn in his hand. Okay, this is a cool angel. I'm not going to lie. Angels can come in many forms. In this case, the angel came as someone with a sword. That's kind of, I don't know, it's like epic, at least in this context. So the she donkey turned aside, okay, turned aside from the road and went into a field. So I picture like, I don't know why I'm picturing like a cornfield. Maybe because I've driven through America and like that seems to be like a thing. Like a cornfield. What do they have in Georgia? I feel like they don't have, do they have cornfields? What, what, what kind of fields would there be in Georgia? Who knows what kind of fields they would have? Cotton. Cotton field. Okay. There you go. So imagine Balaam riding his donkey, his she donkey, and an angel is there. He doesn't see the angel. The donkey sees the angel. Donkey is frightened and turns off into, into the, the cotton field. So what happens next? Balaam beat the she donkey to get it back onto the road. Oh, he's clapping. He's hitting. He's abusing that donkey. The angel. Okay. The, the journey continues. Verse 24. Now the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. So obviously, I mean, the Torah is not giving us the entire play by play, but at some point on the road, the path turned into a vineyard and there was a fence with a fence on this side and a fence on that side. So now we're dealing with a narrow, a, a more of a narrow path with a fence, maybe a wall on one side. When it says a fence, don't picture chain link. They didn't have chain link fences. This would be like a wooden, like a wooden fence on one side, on the other. So it couldn't turn off into the field anymore, into the vineyard. It was, uh, there was a road with, um, Barriers on either side. The she donkey, verse 25, the she donkey saw the angel of the Lord once again, and she was pressed against the wall. In other words, the she donkey couldn't go into the vineyard because there was a wall, so it smushed, smushed against the wall. She pressed Balaam's leg against the wall. I, he crushed her, she crushed his leg. I crushed. She pressed it against the wall. And you guessed it. He beat her again. The angel of the Lord continued to go uh, going ahead. And he stood in a narrow place. So now fast forward the journey a little bit. And now there's a really narrow road. Where there was no room to turn left. Sorry, to turn right or left. The she donkey saw the angel of the Lord. And it crouched. So now and there's nowhere to go. Can't go into a field. Can't even smush around, you know, make a make a little uh, end around by like scraping against the wall. There's nowhere to go. It's a very tight space. So what did it do? The donkey crouched down under Balaam. It just stopped. Not going into the sword, the angel with the sword. Balaam's anger flared and he beat the she donkey with a stick. <sighs> Interesting. I feel bad for the donkey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I feel the same exact way. In fact, the donkey is going to have something to say about this, literally. But what I, I also just noticed, it only mentions stick the third time. The first two times, it says Balaam beat the she donkey. And it doesn't say how. Or it doesn't say they, with a stick. Second time, also, he beat her again. And the third time, it used the word bemakel, which means a stick or a staff. Interesting. I am sure it's not even a question in my mind that the commentaries deal with that. And, and I'm sure that wrinkle, that little, the third, only the third time it talks to stick opens up like a whole piece of the narrative, which I'm not familiar with or which I don't remember. So um, just putting that out there. So now he beats her three times. First time when she took a detour into a field, the second time when she squished against the wall, and the third time when she stopped in the middle of the road and would not go further. At this point, the Lord opened the mouth of the she donkey. And she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these three times? It's like, what, what are you doing? What's, what's with the hitting? What's with the violence? 
Balaam said to the she donkey. Now I love how he he. You know, one reaction might have been, "Holy cow, my donkey is talking! This is crazy." No, he goes with it. He just engages in conversation. He says he replies to the she donkey, not like, "How in the world are you talking?" He explains himself. For you have humiliated me. You've humiliated me. If I had a sword in my hand as opposed to the stick, I would kill you right now. Wow. This guy's doubling down on the violence. By the way, Joy, I totally agree with you. I mean, the, this Balaam guy is, is a hothead, violent man, and clearly arrogant because when the donkey didn't go exactly where he wanted to do, he got humiliated. Are you kidding me? Balaam? Bro, it's a donkey. It's a journey. It's like, take it easy. It's like, you know, my car, uh, uh, you know, whatever. I popped a tire. I'm so embarrassed. I'm really, is that so humiliated? I mean, like, all right. I mean, you're, you're that important that like, your donkey doesn't cooperate and you get all humiliated. I mean, really, is that, is that how that works? Balaam? Anyway, talk about a guy with a fragile ego. Just get, right, not going to lie. That's what it sounds like to me. He's humiliated by the donkey turning off into a field, squishing against a, a, a fence and stopping in the middle of the road. That's what gets you all going. All right. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, apparently. Uh, let's get back inside. Sorry, I'm just like taking shots of Balaam. That's what's happening. Just so you know what, what I'm doing. I'm taking shots of Balaam um, on a personality level over here now. Let's continue back inside. Anyway, and he threatens like he, he's actually threatening to kill the donkey. Just just so we can reset that verse. Verse 30, the she donkey said to Balaam, and again, this, narrative, this conversation continues as if it's normal. The she donkey said to Balaam, am I not your she donkey on which, you, and on which you have ridden since you first started until now? Have I been accustomed to do this to you? In other words, is, are you suspecting me of totally violating your trust and going against your wishes and, has this been a, you know, has this been a, um, a behavior that I've commonly done? And he said, no. And was, what she was trying to tell him is, hold, hold, maybe there's something going on here. If it's unusual behavior, maybe there's something unusual happening, like an angel standing in the middle of the road within a sword, right? Why assume? Okay, let's, let's stop here for a second. Because I'm about to say something, but I want to make sure that it has the proper, like, attention, like, at least so I can see you guys. Um, we always have a choice in life. Someone says something, does something, or doesn't say th something, or doesn't do something, do doesn't do something, right? Either action or inaction. We have a choice. And the choice is how to interpret that behavior or lack of behavior, right? So somebody was supposed to do something, they didn't do it, okay? That's the fact. They were supposed to, and they didn't. Okay, great. Now you have a now. Now the ball is in your court. So they didn't do something they were supposed to do. That's clear. But now the ball's in your court. How do you interpret that? How do you make sense of that? Now, now uh, there could be a million different scenarios that led to that inaction more than a million, it could be an infinite number of possible scenarios that led to that inaction. But here's a general question. Are you, gonna, are you going to assume the best or the worst? That's the choice. Are you gonna assume the best or the worst? Are you gonna assume, oh my gosh, a bad person, uh, blah, 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 blah. Are you gonna assume the worst? Or are you gonna assume the, the best about the other person? You know, that they, 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 they meant well or whatever it is, and something came up, and da, da, da. again, you don't have to actually fill in the details of the narrative. The question is just best or worst. And now in Judaism, in Judaism, we know what, what, what our tradition teaches us. Have they done at kal hadam bekaf schut? We should always judge our fellow on the side of merit. In other words, if we're faced with a choice, should we judge someone or, you know, see it disfavorably or favorably? Go favorably. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Because 
we don't really know what happened, correct? Even if we know what happened, we don't know what happened. Sorry. Even if we know the action, we don't know what actually happened behind the action. Therefore, the donkey is schooling Balaam. This is a classic case of Life 101. The donkey, the donkey is now educating the grosser prophet, the big Navi, right? The big prophet Balaam. The donkey is telling him the following. She says, have I been trustworthy? Yeah. Have I ever done anything unusual? Anything to defy your wishes? No. Okay, great. Now, I've done unusual things three times. I detoured into a field, squished your leg against the fence, and stopped the middle of the road. Correct? That's the fact. Yes? Correct. We're, so everyone's on the same page. We have the history of obedience, and we have the present reality of three unusual um, actions that are less than obedient. Great. Now you have a choice, Mr. Balaam. You can judge me as a terrible donkey, as a disloyal donkey, as a you know horrible creature that deserves to be killed by the sword, or maybe, just maybe, there's a reason why I pulled off into the field, smushed against the fence, and stopped in the middle of the road. Maybe, just maybe, you should give others the benefit of the doubt because you don't know you, you don't know so you can assume the worst ah disobedient or you can assume the best there's probably a good reason you went to the worst and so now god says let me show you the real reason this is the next verse let's read it inside together the lord opened balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a sword drawn in his hand. Now Balaam finally sees what the donkey saw the whole time. The angel with the sword. He bowed and prostrated himself on his face. By the way, I don't think I finished the moral of the story. I don't think I needed to, but just so you know, the moral of the story is judge others. Let's judge each other favorably, even when there clearly seems to be an action that's not the action that we would like, okay, but what's behind it? We don't know, right? So let's, if the choice is to judge favorably, let's judge favorably. Back inside, the angel of the Lord, the one with the sword, said to him, Balaam, why have you beaten your she donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out, sorry, behold, I have came out? No, it doesn't sound right. I don't know. I think it's I think it's a typo. Behold, I have come out to thwart you. For the one embarking on the journey has hastened against me. Behold, I have come out to thwart you, the angel says to Balaam. For the one embarking on the journey, I would, I'm assuming that's him, has hastened against me. In other words, by you going out on this journey, you're going against the will of God. And as an angel, I find that offensive. Something like that. That's how I understand it. When the she donkey saw me, the angel continues, it turned aside these three times. Had she not turned aside before me, now also I would have killed you and spared her the she donkey. <laughs> Love it. Love it. Balaam is getting educated by a donkey. A talking donkey, a oh, Shrek, a talking donkey, and, 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 an angel. The angel says, by the way, had the donkey not done that? Had it not veered off into the field? Had it not, you know, brushed up against the wall? Had it not stopped in the middle of the road? Had it gone into me? I would have killed you with the sword, with this sword. I would have spared the donkey. I would have killed you because you're the one going on this journey. Uh by the way, Mr. Balaam, you might want to thank the donkey for saving your life. And thus, the entire plot flips upside down. Right? Balaam is so upset. That I'll, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. You're, oh, you're, blah, 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 blah. That's Balaam. Balaam is like, oh, like just enraged. How dare you humiliate me? If you can get humiliated by a donkey. Yeah, I'm just going to say this. I know, I know I'm picking on him, but whatever. It's, he's the villain in the story. 
if you can get humiliated by a donkey, that's got to be, it, you just got to recalibrate. That's got to be a sign to recalibrate. That, that should not, that should not get you going to that extent. Anyway, the point of the angel is don't be upset at the donkey. Don't threaten the donkey. Your, your life was in danger. Your life was in danger. Um, and she saved it. So you might want to, may want to, you know, take her out to dinner, give her some good, whatever, donkey food to thank her for that. All right, back inside. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. At least he admits to it. Chatasi, I've sinned. It's not bad. Um, for I did not know that you were standing on the road before me. Um, and I love this line that we just read. I have sinned, for I did not know. The question that the commentators ask is, hold on, if he really didn't know, then why is it a sin? He should have said, I made a mistake. I did not know. He said, I've sinned, for I did not know. And the answer is, you know why? You know why it's a sin? Because for him not to know is a sin. He's, he's a prophet. How does he not know that there was an angel? Uh, Mr. Spiritual. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, for you, that's a sin. You're, you're, you're expected to know these things. You're expected to know about the spiritual stuff. All right, now he gets to his question. Now, if it displeases you, he says to the angel, I will return. In other words, let me know if I should turn back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with these men, but the word I will speak to you that you shall speak. Here it sounds like he's being told specifically to go. But again, you could also understand it as a, once you headed out and made that choice to go, I'm not going to stop you from going. I'll let you decide how to continue your action with your free choice. But you will know one thing that I will, whatever I tell you to say, you're going to say. So Balaam went with Balak's dignitaries. He went, the prophet went with the king of Moab's dignitaries. All right, a few more verses, then we're going to go back to Rashi, and a few more lessons. Balak, the king, heard that Balaam, the prophet, was coming. Wow, after all that effort, finally he got his guy. So he went out toward him to the city of Moab, which is on the border of Arnon, at the extreme edge of the border. It's interesting. The city of Moab, what city? Moab was the name of the country. That was the name of the land. Was there also a city called Moab, like New York, New York? Maybe like Moab, Moab. <laughs> it's like, ah, I'm writing a letter to Balak, uh, addressing it to 145 uh, Main Street, Moab, Moab. Anyway, or is it just the city of Moab on the border and it's not specified? Not sure. Anyway, but it's at the border of Arnon. Arnon was the, uh, the place where that miracle happened where the Amorites were, li were lying in wait in the cave and then the mountains got crushed together and they died, the enemy died. Anyway, so this is like, I think it's probably the southern border of Moab at the extreme edge of the border. So that's where Balak was waiting for Balaam's approach. Balak the king said to Balaam the prophet, did I, beef, I don't know, just people with egos. Did I not send to call? Did I not send to you to call for you? Why did you not come to me? Am I indeed incapable of honoring you? Basically saying, like, why did it, why did it take so long? I, I, I called for you a while ago. I sent messengers. And like, what's, what's going on? Why does it take so long? Ay, 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 people, people. Balaam said to Balak, behold, I have come to you. In other words, just, just be, 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 live in the present. Do I have any power to say anything? In other words, it's not, it's not really my choice how this all plays out. The word that God puts into my mouth, that I will speak. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. I just, I just think of ego. To me, this reading, you know, every time you read a piece of Torah, it just evokes something else. You know, Balak, uh, sorry, Balaam, the prophet, is humiliated by a donkey. Humiliated. That's how he feels it. And then this guy, Balak, the king, he's all defensive. He's all like, 
am I am I incapable of honoring you? Why don't you come to me initially? Like you you don't think I can pay you? You don't think I can honor you? Just very, very not confident these uh, individuals in their positions. Okay, let's uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. So in the morning, Balaam arose and saddled his she donkey. Rashi says. From here, we learn that hate causes a disregard for the standard of dignified conduct. For he saddled it himself. He was so excited to embark on the mission to, God forbid, curse the Jews, that he himself saddled his donkey. He didn't have his assistance. The whole one must be, he said, wicked one. Ugh, you fool, you evil one. Their father, the Jewish patriarch Abraham, has already preceded you. As it says, Abraham arose in the morning and saddled his donkey. That was by the binding of Isaac. That's a guy who was inspired in the morning to get things going in a positive way. And you were just driven by hate, by profit, by money, by fame, by ego. And so you're selling your own donkey. It's not going to work. He went with the Moabite dignitaries. Rashi clarifies his intent was the same as theirs. And that, that's, I think, in a very important Rashi. It's very subtle, but very important. You know, one might come away from the story thinking that Balaam didn't really hate the Jews. He just wanted a payday. He just wanted money. It's like, um, I don't know, like a hacker who, um, what is it? Um, the latest cyber stuff. It's, um, where they lock the computers, you know what I'm talking about? Where they like shut down the computer systems. There's a name for it. Whatever. Anyway, so, you know, it's like somebody might say, hey, listen, you, so, so an evil consortium might call, might, uh, you get a hacker on board to shut down like a hospital, God forbid, I mean, gee, like, but shut down a system of computers and for ransom, a ransomware, right? For ransom. And the hacker's like, I don't, I don't actually have any beef with this system. I, I you know, I don't, I don't have anything against you. I just, I'm just, just getting paid. So we might walk away from this narrative and think like, Balaam didn't really have an agenda against the Jewish people. He just wanted to get paid. Rashi clarifies that that's not the case. He did have an agenda against the Jewish people. His intent was the same as theirs, just like their intent was not to get money. They were paying the money. Their intent was to curse the Jewish people and bring about the downfall of the Jew God forbid of the Jewish people. His intent was the same. Let's continue. God's wrath flared because he was going. Um, he saw that this was considered evil by the omnipresent. As I mentioned at the beginning of today's conversation, God, God had said that this wasn't good, yet he longed to go. He wished to go, and God didn't stop him. Well, he toyed with him a little bit with an angel. The angel uh, was there to thwart him. Rashi clarifies it was an angel of mercy. It wasn't an, an angel of, of, um, of punishment, of comeuppance. It was an angel of mercy. Rachamim, malasha rachamim haya. And he wanted to prevent him from sinning. For should he sin, he would perish. He was actually trying to help Balaam with two servants. From here, we learn that a distinguished person who embarked on the journey should take two people with him to attend him. Wow. Halavai, we should all be so, uh, so lucky to have two people attending to us in our journeys. Yeah. We take a road trip to Florida. Next thing you know, we have two people assisting somehow. Oh, sorry, can I help you out of your car? Can I help pump the gas at the... Sure, this is weird. But yeah, I mean, like, yeah, he had two people and here we learn a lesson about having people attend to us on our journeys. All right, the she donkey saw, but Balaam did not see. For God permitted a beast to perceive more than a man. Since, the, since man possesses intelligence, he would become insane if he saw demons. I love the implications of this Rashi. Rashi is saying, in general, animals have a, a, a stronger spiritual perception than human beings. Because if human beings saw all the spiritual stuff, they would go mishuga. Animals, whatever, I've got hay, right? Animals can handle, it's almost like um, the less sensitive, not that animals aren't sensitive, but the less intellectually sensitive a thing is, the more it can behold, the more it can take in, and it'll still be okay. But if we take in too much, it just becomes potentially just devastating and destructive 
for the human psyche. I love the, the concept implied here or stated here that animals are seeing things, you know, seeing forces. Kind of cool. Your pet cat, your pet dog, your pet uh, giraffe, whatever it is, um, your pet donkey, goat, and turtle all might, according to this Rashi, be able to see things that you cannot. We know this with hearing, by the way, right? Dogs have a very um, strong sense of hearing. They can hear um, sound waves that we can't hear. Is this correct? I, I've heard this. Rabbi, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it might. It might be a really strange story, but I'll I'll share it. It's like real short. I won't butcher it like last time. <laughs> but my puppy, when she was a little girl, like so, I'd be I'd be like you know giving her attention, and she would be looking off into the distance at like things I could I like, you know. I felt like she was like looking at things around that I couldn't see. I don't know how to explain it. It's weird. That's interesting. That's interesting. Right. Like perceiving energies that we can't look Rashi's it's, it it seems like it's an obvious thing. In fact, what's weird about this Rashi, I'm going to put it up again. And thank you for sharing that story. And it makes sense, but look at this Rashi. It doesn't even have a source at the end of it. Like most Rashi's, you see, there's a bracket. It's Midrashan Chuma, uh, Bambaraba. Again, it's got the Midrashic sources here, here, almost everywhere. Well, in most places. But this one, it's just Rashi. I mean, I'm sure he got it from somewhere, but it's kind of like, yeah, obviously, animals have this vision that humans don't have. So kind of, it kind of makes sense. The story makes sense that an animal has a perception. Look, I think that... Um, even, and I'll stop sharing again, just so I can see everybody, even on a, um, on a physical level, right? Let's say aside from, it, clearly Rashi's talking about the spiritual level. Like they can see literally spiritual forces that we cannot see. Because if we would see them, we would go nuts. That's literally what he's saying. We would go, it would be too overwhelming for us to, to be able to, to deal with, but animals, they can deal with. But I think even on a physical level, you can see some manifestation of this. Like I said before, dogs can hear, uh, um, sound frequencies that we can hear. Or, for example, like a dog might sense danger or an animal, whatever, might sense a danger, you know, that is not yet in the, um, in the awareness, in the orbit of, of the person. Person might not hear, see, or feel anything, but the dog will be like, something's going on. Right? Somebody approaches the front door. Is it the hearing? I don't know what it is. But like, there's something, there's a perception. And again, that's only physical stuff. Rashi's clear, clearly, it's not even a question. Rashi is talking about the spiritual forces. Again, um, God permitted, just to, re, to reread this, God permitted a beast, meaning an animal, to perceive more than a man. That's it. Straight up. Next, Rashi. So, oh, 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 so, so. I, I don't think I'm being radical when I say this, that Rashi's understanding that when the Torah says the she donkey saw, it doesn't say that God opened up the she donkey's eyes and she was able to see. It doesn't say that. It doesn't imply anything out of the ordinary. It says the she donkey saw the angel. Isn't it? Again, compare that with what it says about um, Balaam. The Lord opened Balaam's eyes. And then he saw. It doesn't say that with the donkey. It just says the donkey saw. And I think that's, if I, if I were a betting man, I would say that's where Rashi is basing his commentary. The she donkey saw. No miracle. Yeah. Because animals can perceive more than us. There you go. So yeah, she saw the, the angel. And so therefore she, so it wasn't a miracle. I mean, the fact that she talked, was that's a miracle. Um, but this part of it, eh, seems normal. Okay, with a sword drawn in his hand. He said, the angel said, this wicked man, Balaam, has forsaken the tools of his own art. For the weapon of the heathen nations is the sword, and he's coming against them with the power of his mouth which is their specialty. I too will take hold of his art and accost him with his own art. 
In other words, Balaam was trying to use the Jewish power against the Jewish people, the, the words, the language, right? Speech against it. So the angel said, okay, if you're going to use their weapon, I'll use your own weapon against you. You're of the nations. You're of the, you know, from the ace of tradition. I don't know if he was literally or, or, or metaphorically from that uh, lineage and that, that heritage, but their power is in the, in the sword. Okay. So I'm going to use a sword and hold that up against you. This indeed was his fate. It says in Balaam, son of Baar, they slew with the sword. That ultimately is what happens in a war later on in the book of numbers, but we'll get there in a few weeks. Next, the eight, oh, and Sandrine. I got the answer to you. Am I going to remember the answer? Oh. You, Sandrine asked the question yesterday, when will, when will the Torah portions be reconciled? And I yes, believe, in Israel. And I believe. <laughs> and actually now I think that, you know, I asked Faya to bring me back the calendar from Israel. So I'm going to be, I'm going to have to be mindful of that. <laughs> no, no, I think the answer, no, I looked it up. I looked it up yesterday. And I believe, I have, an, I have a calendar in the other room. I just don't want to get up right now. And and uh, and walk away. But I believe it was Matot Masse, the last two portions of this book, of um, yeah, of the book of Numbers. I believe it's the last Torah, the the, the last two portions we're going to do together. They're going to do separately. So you know they'll they'll be they're ahead by one week. So when they do the second week, Masse. We'll do matot masse, and we'll catch right up. That's uh, that's what I believe. That's when I believe it's gonna it's gonna catch up. But I did also look up. I think there were four or five opportunities that we could have done double portions and caught up that we didn't yet take that opportunity until we're gonna get to this one. So it's coming up in a few weeks because this is Balak, Pinchas. Is it matot masse? There's only a few weeks. All right. Okay. You know what? At, by the end, if somebody reminds me when we, when we finish the reading, I'll run to the other room and bring it back. Okay. We'll, so, but it's going to be before Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll be okay. okay with my Israeli calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Good. All right. Um, the angel stood in a path. Okay. This is linguistic with the fence on either side. Oh, look at that. Rashi clarifies it wasn't wood. It was made of stone. Ooh, that's painful. Squished his leg against that. She was pressed. Um, she herself pressed herself against the wall. And she also pressed something else, namely Balaam's leg. So she herself squished against the wall to go around the angel. And Balaam's leg also got squished. The angel of the Lord continued to go ahead. He continued further ahead of him, that is, to be before him in another spot. Man, I just picture the angel like, all right, they went around me. Quickly, up ahead. Run. Position, you know, next position. Um, the Medrash HaGad and Tanchuma asks, what made him stop in three places? Right, the angel stops once, twice, and a third time. Why three places? For the angel showed Balaam symbols alluding to the patriarchs. Ah, three, you're messing with the nation. That is three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You might want to rethink that. The Lord opened the mouth of the she-donkey. Oh, yeah, for sure what I said before. I Listen, I don't know for, what do I know? But I would, I, if I were a betting man, I would bet on myself right now. Look, when it comes to, to the donkey speaking, it says the Lord opened her mouth. When it comes to Balaam seeing the angel, it says God opened his eyes. When it comes to the donkey seeing the angel, the, the, the donkey saw. There's no miracle mention. That's why Rashi says it's normal for animals to see spiritual beings. Anyway, the Lord opened the mouth. This was a miracle. Speaking donkeys of the she donkey. And she said, what have I done? You've struck me these three times. He hinted to him. I guess God hinted through this. You seek to uproot a nation which celebrates three festivals. Okay, I need to explain that. The, the language that the donkey uses, shalosh regalim, which could mean three times. It could also mean three legs. It can also mean three holidays. We call the three Jew, uh, pilgrimage holidays shalosh regalim, Passover, 
Shavuot and Sukkot are the Shalosh Regalim. So again, it's a nod and a wink to the fact that this guy was trying to, God forbid, curse the Jewish people. You're messing with the people that have three patriarchs and that have three pilgrimage holidays. Ain't going to work. Balaam said to the Shidanki, you, you have humiliated. That is a term, Rashi says, denoting shame and disgrace. I, and I'm going to just quadruple down on this. If someone's humiliated by a donkey, you got to recalibrate. Um, if I had a sword in my hand, this matter made him greatly contemptible in the eyes of the dignitaries. This man was going to kill an entire nation with his mouth. Yet for a she donkey, he needed weapons. That is hilarious. That is absolutely hilarious. In other words, the fact that Balaam threatens the she donkey, if I had a sword, I would kill you. It's like, oh, I thought you use, I thought you curse people that things to kill them. You can't now. Your 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 superpowers are gone. This reminds me of something that somebody once told me about David Copperfield. You know David Copperfield, the magician. Yeah. So, you know, one of his like classic stage tricks is that he'll be, I mean, magic, is that he could be on stage in, let's say, Madison Square Garden, and then they put up a curtain, and they drop it, like, the second later, and he's all the way in the back of the theater, in the audience. It's like, holy cow, teletransportation, he was on the stage, and it was in the back of the theater. That's amazing. He's a magician. And yet, and yet this man, this man, right, it's Madison Square Garden, 34th Street, this same man took a taxi cab from his hotel room on 23rd Street to 34th Street. This, it's like, bro, if you can really tell a transport, why are we paying for the cab fare? Why do we fly you to LA or to Vegas for a show? It's like, bro, can't you just put up a curtain and appear? Okay, turns out, turns out, turns out, probably just gonna assume that, that there's something not actually happening with the teletransportation, which is why he does need a taxi ride and he does need an airplane ride when he needs to go places. He doesn't have the magic. Balaam can curse everybody with his mouth. For his donkey, he needs a sword. Really? You need it? Uh, oh, oh, what about all your powers? Okay. We're already seeing where things are, what the score is with this guy, Balaam. Um, all right. Let's back in, let's get back inside. Oh, I see we're, we're uh, getting there with the time. Um, yeah, this gets a little uh, uncomfortable. The she donkey says to Balaam, am I not your she donkey on which you have ridden since you first started? Have I, have I been accustomed to this to you? Rashi, um, a rabbi, however, expounded this verse in Talmud. The, they, the Moabite dignitary, said to him, why aren't you riding on a horse? Oof. This is so awkward. Why aren't you riding on a horse? Why did Balaam said to them, I sent it out to pasture. Immediately the Shidanki retorted, Am I not your Shidanki? He said to her, Just for bearing burdens. She retorted, On which you have ridden. He said to her, Only on occasion. She retorted, Since you first started until now. And not only that, but I provide you with riding by day and with intimacy at night, as is stated in Tractate of Odazara. So apparently, he knew this donkey very well, and um, they had a thing. And and again, the the point here is, I don't, I don't really know what to do with that with that idea from the Talmud, but the point is that like and still he I, I don't know if it's and still I'm I'm not sure how to how to how to move on from that or how to move with that, but I think the point is that he's accusing and blaming and getting aggressive and getting all emotional. Meanwhile, uh, yeah, they've, uh, they've, they've had this connection for a while. 32, for the traveler has hastened against me. Hold on. I'm going to skip that Rashi. Um, ba, 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 um, I would also have killed you, says the angel to Balaam. I would have killed you also. I would also have killed you. I mean, it's saying not only would the delay have befallen you through me, but even your death. Aha. Not only would you have been delayed, but I would have actually killed you, says the, says the angel. If you would have, if you would have come closer to me, 
Had the donkey not done its thing, I would have not only delayed you, which you were delayed, but I would have actually killed you also and spared her. But now since she spoke and rebuked you and you could not withstand the rebuke, as written, he said, no, therefore I have killed her. The people should not say this is the one that sounds balm with her rebuke and he could not respond. Wow. Oh, I don't know that I like this ending. For the omnipresence shows regard for human dignity. Similarly, you shall kill the, the woman and the animal through which the sin was committed, and you shall kill the animal. Interesting. Mm. Okay. In other words, Rashi is saying that the angel said to him, had the donkey not stopped, I would have killed you, not her. But now that she did stop, I'll kill her. So that you're so that you should not be humiliated by a donkey, essentially. So that no one should say, this is the one that silenced Balaam with her rebuke, and he could not respond. In other words, to protect his dignity, so this animal is taken out. I, again, I don't know how I feel about that. I actually have very um, not uh, thrilled feelings about that. And yet that's what we have over here. Okay, listen. Shivim Panam Latar, there are 70 facets. So this is this is one of them. Um, Balaam said, I have sinned for I did not know. This too is a mark of disgrace for him. But he was forced to concede. For earlier he had boasted that he was aware of the thoughts of the Most High. But now his mouth professed, I, do, I, I did not know. Because he claims to be the big know, knower of all things spiritual. And now he's forced to admit, I, 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 I didn't see, I didn't know. If it displeases you, I will return. This reply was a challenge against God, uh, the omnipresent. Balaam said to him, God himself commanded me to go, yet you an angel in those words. This was his custom. He says one thing and an angel and an angel retracts it. He said to Abraham, take now your son. And through an angel, he knows his words. I too, if it displeases you, I will have to return. Aha. So he was like mocking God, like, oh, God says one thing and, and then the angel says something else. You guys make up your mind. But again, like I told you before, God never changed his mind. It was always like, no, but I'm not going to stop you. But I'm going to toy around with you. I'm going to tell, let you know that you're not all that you think you are. Um, go with these men. And Rashi, you know, Rashi says exactly what I was saying before from Rabbi Sachs. A man is led along the path he wishes to follow. This is not God or the angel saying go. This is a person being allowed to choose their own path. A man is led along the path he wishes to follow means that God does not intervene typically with a person's free choice. You know, people ask, even when it comes to horrible tragedy, how come God didn't intervene? And the answer is because God, typically God does not intervene when it comes to free choice. Go with these men for your portion is with them and you are destined to perish from the world. In other words, go and that will be your destiny end. But against your will, the word I will speak to you that you shall speak. He went with Balak's dignitaries. He was glad to curse them as much as they were. Not glad to curse the Jewish people, as we said before. Balak heard, he sent messengers ahead to inform him that Balaam was on his way, um, and he met him by the city of Moab, its capital, its most important city, as if to say, look, what these people are trying to uproot. Uh -huh. Basically, he met him at the capital saying, look at our beautiful city, look at our beautiful capital, and the Jewish people are a threat. You have to curse them and make sure they don't destroy our beautiful capital city. Um, Balak said to Balaam, am I indeed incapable of honoring you? He prophesied that in the end, he would leave him in disgrace. A lot of shame and disgrace. And, you know, to me, it all goes back to one word, and that's ego. Not to overuse this idea, but to me, it's clear that all the players here have just an absolute overabundance of ego and fragile machismo. Am I saying the words correctly? Is that, are those words, are those actual real English words, machismo? Is that, is that a word? I don't think I've ever said the word. I've read it. Is that how you say it? Yeah. Like, like the idea of like a macho. It's like, yeah, you're all macho, but really underneath that, there's all this, all this, like you're know, very fragile ego so that, you know, if, um, the Jewish people are doing their thing, like, Oh, you become all threatened. And if somebody doesn't answer, your your first request you become very defensive like oh am i not good enough for you and if um your donkey stops in the middle of the road you have to beat the donkey lest the donkey humiliate you like all this all this um 
this lack of confidence that really comes from ego. It's very paradoxical. It's paradoxical. It's like ego that leads to a, a, a real genuine lack of confidence. Ego should not be confused with confidence. Ego is a person shouting how strong they are. And usually you do that when you don't feel so strong inside. And the proof is in the pudding. The bottom line is when, when, when um, challenge hits, where do you go? Do you go to a place of ugliness or to a place that's a little bit deeper and stronger? That's the question. You go to a place of ugliness, it's a sign that, that, that inside is not so strong. And that's what we see here. Balak, Balam, cut from the same cloth, essentially. The story is one of those stories that are really just incredible on every level, right? It's funny, it's sad, it's, it's all of the above. When I say funny, I mean talking donkeys is just like, if, if humor is the... Um, the colliding of the unexpected with the, you know, with, with the, with the scenario. And I think this would be in the running Hollywood definitely learned from this. Like I said before, Shrek talking donkeys. And um, I guess many a Disney movie, right? Everyone talks in Disney movies. I mean, all the animals talk. All right. So that's it for today. What's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is be confident, not from a place of ego, from a place of God confidence or divine ego. And that means God created you. God believes in you. Believe in yourself. You have an ashama. You have a lot to do. Somebody gets in the way. It's their issue. It's not my issue. Somebody doesn't do exactly what we would like. I'm sure they have a good reason. I'm not going to waste my time spinning out of control in my own head. I got my stuff. They have their stuff. I'm going to judge them for the positive and we're going to roll forward. That's what it really means to be confident. All right. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope this made sense. Any questions, comments, rebuttals? I'm still upset about the donkey. Not going to lie. If anybody finds something about the donkey, why the donkey had to go, um, I would have loved for that donkey to have been a good reminder to Balaam. Anyway. All right. We'll see you all. Enjoy. Enjoy, enjoy. Sarah, Joy, Sandrine, and Ray. Take care. And Ray, happy birthday. So much love. Ray, happy birthday from all of us. And hope it's a wonderful day. We'll see you soon. I wanted to show you the, the beautiful uh, landscape where I am to take that class. Oh, wow. Look at that. That's nice. That's nice. I, that's beautiful. I don't, I don't mean to like, um, that's, that's Florida. I don't mean to like upstage you because I'm not that type of guy. Cause I, my ego is not, but I do also <laughs> want to show you my, uh, my gorgeous view in my office. Oh, wait, there's no, <laughs> Oh wait, there's some books and, and some other things. Nice. Where are you Sandra? I'm in St. George Island. Okay. Florida, yeah. I'm the way, I mean, I'm the way south. No, south in the Gulf of Mexico. And Sarah, where do you live? I'm in Brooksville, so the Gulf Coast. Nice. Okay, so let's go right here. The Gulf of Mexico. Okay. I don't know. Can you hear you? Nice. Nice. nice to, to nice. just watch your water. Yeah. Beautiful. There's something very relaxing about the water. I'm sure I've told you my story with uh, Mitch Album in, uh, where was that? In California. <sighs> when Mitch Album invited me and my friends into his house. You know Mitch Album, Tuesdays with Maury, the author, that guy? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Told you this. So I've told yeah. the story. Yeah, yeah. It's like my, my semi-celebrity right. encounter. I don't know. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. But yeah, there's something about like the water, the ocean. Uh, it's beautiful. Anyway, well, Kala Kavod, enjoy. And uh, yeah. all right, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow we're on, same bad time, same bad channel. Okay. All right, we'll see you guys. Have a wonderful day. Take Good care. Day, Ray. Bye.